Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. Today we have a very interesting topic to talk about regarding transitions. So the buying and selling of practices. So Robert and Lynn and Ash, myself, we're here today to talk about this. Um, uh, How should we start today's episode? Well, these are a lot of the questions I'm getting this year from callers, and that is, you know, do you have any practices that you know of for sale? Number one. Number two, uh, should I buy a practice or should I just start one? And that's the big question. That's always been the big question. And I think it has to do with how much risk you're willing to take on. You know, some buyers are more willing to start from scratch and they spend half a million dollars and then they open the doors and there's no patient standing there. So it's, 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 it's kind of a gamble, but you know, the, the failure rate for new practices per the lenders that evaluate these things is very low. It, it's the, the, one of the best one or two businesses in the United States to start. Um, of course, there's less risk in, in buying an existing practice because you have cash flow already built in. And you're taking on probably about the same amount of debt you would be if you're starting one up, but you have cash flow already. So it's just a matter of whether you can find one, a good practice for sale or not. A good practice for the right price. Uh, and that's a whole other consideration, yes. Because the prices over the last couple of years have been driven upwards by the demand. There's more demand than there is a supply of practices. And that's because the DSOs are snapping up all the really good practices. And they're, in my opinion, overpaying for those. Or they're certainly paying more than traditional valuation models would imply. And so the doctors are selling to the DSOs. And that leaves the entrepreneur dentist out there looking for a practice that might not be you know, the, the cherry of the crop. They're um, having to, to overpay for substandard practices. And there still isn't enough to satisfy demand. So you're saying essentially that if a potential buyer were to find a good practice, they should look into taking over a practice as opposed to starting one up because it has less risks? There is certainly less risk, yes. Now there is are other considerations. One of those is, uh, I know there was a professor down at one of the dental schools that used to tell people, don't pay for other people's mistakes. Go create your own. (laughs) But what he meant by that was, don't go buy a practice that someone else has created bad habits in for 20 years. Go start your own and create your own bad habits. That's really what he was saying, or good habits. Good habits, right. Right. Um, But it's just... Supply and demand is just that you're not going to be able to do that as much today uh, if you're in a hurry to find a practice. It, 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 timing is the whole issue. You know, if, you, if you're patient, wait and try to find a practice. Uh, but if you're chomping at the bit to get started on your own, uh, building your own empire, your own uh, building, your own uh, practice, then you're going to have to, to start one from scratch. And then you have to be careful about location selection, Mm -hmm. demographics, things like that, or that's going to increase your risk. Well, and and I tell people the most important thing in looking for a new practice is just like buying any real estate. The three most important things are location, 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 and location. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, And that sounds, I guess that sounds odd, but you know, you are looking at demographic of patients and then it has to do with location. Right. You're looking at, at growth rates and that has to do with location. So everything you have to do to, to consider in that practice really is tied to location. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So even though there's less risk in 
buying an existing practice. There's also a lot more debt potentially that goes along with that. If you can start your own practice for half a million, you may find a practice to buy for a million or a million five or depending, you know, depending on the size or number of locations. And you still consider that less risk because people are afraid to take on that kind of debt. But, you know, it, it, so some people are afraid of taking on that kind of debt and some people are afraid of opening the doors, like you said, and hearing crickets right. and mm-hmm. no bodies. So it, it just depends on the individual. I mean, there's risks under both circumstances, but you do have cash flow already if you buy an existing practice. And that's at least something you can manage. And before you buy that practice, you make sure it is going to cash flow to pay the loan. So sure. you know you're walking into something that is going to work if sure. you don't that's, drive those patients away. That's part of the valuation process. When you look at the, the, the financials of the practice you're buying, uh, I always take the financials and, and sort of recast them in the light of the purchaser. We add back expenses that the purchaser is not going to be liable for, such as the seller's automobile and the pension plan and other things. And we look at the adjusted cash flow going forward. And would that be enough to service the debt that you're going to incur to buy the practice? Also pay the doctor a reasonable take-home pay, salary, and enough to pay taxes on that. And if it's not, then, you know, it, it's, it's not worth buying. Right. And I've seen some that weren't. It just, uh, you know, they're kind of that in-between stage where it's not profitable enough, overhead's too high. You'd have to go in there and make some massive changes, and then that's not good in any transition. No, and we've seen buyers get really upset because they have their heart set on a practice that is not going to be a good deal from a cash flow standpoint. But if they overpay for it, they're going to be sorry. You, you really have to go into it willing to walk away if you can't get the price that it takes to cash flow it and survive feed your family yeah you really do uh, and you're right people get emotional about it and um overly emotional about it and uh, you know i'll look at it and uh, tell them this isn't gonna fit and and they'll go buy it anyway now oh, wow yeah now there's another question that i also get a lot from the clients which is this when i decide to buy a practice or start up a practice how much money should i save do they even need to save any money yeah, I've heard that myself, it. and a lot of times, um, you know, they're they're waiting. Uh, I guess they're they they really haven't read a lot, and they're and they're waiting until they can save up enough for what they think it'll take to make the down payment. Mm-hmm. And I tell them there are lenders out there that'll loan over a hundred percent of the practice acquisition price, and the reason they do that is because they'll loan you enough to use as working capital to pay your bills until you're collecting your own receivables. So you don't need a down payment to buy a dental practice. Oh, wow. Okay. And as far as credit scores are concerned, you know, if your credit score is 675 or better, you're pretty much golden. If it's 650, probably still get you the loan. If it's 625 or lower, it's going to be tough. I see. Those are more or less the parameters most of the lenders have set. Now, as a financial advisor, would you recommend a potential buyer to go into a practice purchase without having any uh, significant amount saved? You know, at today's interest rates, I always tell people, again, as a financial planner, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's it's better to invest your own money. You can probably get a better return than the interest you're going to pay on the money you borrow. So borrow the money for the practice, use your own money to invest and build your own wealth. I mean, if you can get a 6 or 8% return or better on your money and you're only paying 35 or maybe 4% at worst case on the money you're borrowing, then you're coming out way ahead by investing your own money and incurring the debt at 3.5%. For the practice. Right. So then it kind of goes back to what Lynn was talking about earlier that, you know, we have a lot of people that are afraid to open the door because they'll have to incur debt. And to make money, you need to spend money. And a lot of times (laughs) you just need to borrow it. That's the adage. And I've heard that from people over and over is, you know, well, I want to get out of debt. Mm. Well, that's not always the best move, especially with interest rates as low as they are today. Uh It can be, um, financially profitable to actually go into debt Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you invest your own money. I mean, you have to have discipline. You can't spend it all, have a great big party, and then, (laughs) oh, why am I not, you know, more wealthy than I was? Because you're spending all the money you're saving. Don't do that. On the savings, you can exceed the interest rate on your debt. And so you build wealth that way. So that should be the goal. Whatever interest you're having to pay, make sure your growth is more than that. Yes. You'll come out top. Okay. Yeah, those are great tips, Robert. 
uh, well, another question I get a lot of times is, are the, are the banks lending uh, during the pandemic for practice transitions? And there was a pause uh, for a few months when they sort of stepped back and took a look at what was going on and decided to, to wait. Uh, but they've resumed the lending and they resumed that probably six months ago. Uh, they do have a new list of questions, what mm-hmm. they call the COVID questions, <laughs> um, where they're doing some additional financial analysis. But I now see. that we know what those are, and we pretty much have our own list that we've incorporated mm-hmm. from most of the lenders. Uh, and if we can answer those ahead of time, then we know what they're, what they're looking for. And yes, they're still making the loan. I've closed uh, several deals. Um, I wouldn't say post-pandemic. We're not there yet. <laughs> but I've closed several deals in the last uh, four or five months that uh, met all the, uh, we were able to check all the boxes and meet all the requirements for the lenders and got some actually really good rates. That's the other thing. Rates have never been this low. Really? Wow. Uh, one of the deals I closed back in November, I think was, uh, under 3%. So, um, rates have never been that low. Oh, wow. Great. November. So you're saying that the market's very active right now then? Absolutely. Uh, I've, uh, one thing I've noticed this year is most of the calls that I've gotten this year uh, have been from people looking to buy or evaluate a practice that they've come across. Oh, wow. Now, how does this market appear to you right now? Uh, do, you, do we have more buyers, interested buyers, or more sellers? Way more buyers than sellers. Wow. And it's been that way for a long time, but it's never been more so than now. Although I will say, as a result of the pandemic, there are more sellers than there were. That's true. Uh, people have decided, uh, some of the, the, the uh, doctors that have been in practice for a good while, have decided that that's it. The fun's over. Yeah, the fun's over. And so they're, they're ready to get out. I see. Now, when a purchaser or a potential buyer is looking into, let's say, taking over a practice from someone else, are there things that the buyer should be looking into? Like maybe, you know, how did this uh, seller run the practice or do we have shared ideologies or philosophies or um, is, is there anything that they should be looking? Sure. For? Sure. That's one of the things that um, we try to, in an ideal world, you mm-hmm. want to match the buyer and the seller. You would like to have people that are, that have similar practice philosophies. Uh, I always tell people, uh, well, again, one of the questions I get sometimes is what percentage of the patients can I expect to lose in a transition? And if the doctors have similar philosophies, even though they may be 35 years different in age, Mm -hmm. if they have similar philosophies in practice, they're probably not going to lose any patients. Uh But if you have a, you know, an an older doctor who's retiring and he's lost his momentum and he's really just wants to get out, he's really quit trying. Mm -hmm. And you've got a young doctor that comes in here and, 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 Maybe he's going to overdiagnose because he's got a, mm-hmm. a debt that he incurred and he's got to make those payments. <laughs> and so you know, that's not going to go over well. Also, if you have a, a buyer that comes in and wants to change all the people, you know, these people are older. I want younger people. Well, the patients know those people and you have to take that in consideration. I mean, everybody that goes to the dental practice doesn't see the doctor. You know, they see the hygienist, but right. they, they all see the front desk person mm-hmm. and they want to see that same person. They want to see some continuity. And so you need to, keep those same people for some period of time before you start making changes. Okay. So there's a lot of things to consider other than just numbers. Numbers. Yeah. Oh, great tip. I know one thing that, uh, on a practice I've been looking at this week, uh, I noticed, uh, for the first time in a while that the seller is left-handed and (laughs) what's the significance of that? Well, you know, uh, the, the chair systems and the delivery systems are either right-handed or left-handed. So if the buyer is right-handed, she's going to have to incur, incur some unexpected expense right away to convert everything from left hand to right hand. Oh, wow. Yes, and yeah, I'm not sure she considered that. that. So those are little things that you have to think about. Little things, but with a giant invoice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All your yeah, that's true. Wow. Okay. Um, now, from, from a due diligence standpoint, let's say you have decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to buy a practice. What are some of the first few steps that I would need to take? Well, I think, you know, one of the first things you need to do is, uh, and not necessarily in this order, but at some point before you, I guess when you get to the point where you're serious, but you haven't yet closed the deal, obviously, then you want to set up your business entity. And that usually doesn't take near as long as people expect it to. It'll, it, it may take, you know, 10 business days or five business days or somewhere in between. 
uh, I get the impression in talking to people when I tell them that they're all surprised that it, you know, it doesn't take a month, but, but it can really be done in a shorter period of time. One of the other things you need to do right away is, is start on uh, getting your financial information together for the lender, uh, because the lender is the thing that can hold the deal up more than any other uh, one single item, oh, uh, because it, it'll take you minimum three weeks, maximum, I don't know, I'm not sure there is a maximum, over 40 <laughs> days or so to get your loan. Uh, approved. So you want to be sure you have enough time to do that because once you submit a letter of intent and that's accepted, generally you have about 30 days to, to close the deal. I see. So the letter of intent goes to the seller and then within those days you have to basically find your financing or have it confirmed. And we try, yeah, we try to get started on the financing before that. The letter of intent goes to the seller and then once he signs that, mm. then the clock starts running. I see. Now, would it be possible for you to acquire the, your financing before submitting your letter of intent? No, because no. Um, until you have a signed letter of intent, the banks are the banks are going to want to see the letter of intent. They're going to want to see uh, the terms of the deal. Mm -hmm. So you can submit your financing and sort of uh, get what I would call a pre-approval. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate to use that term because mm -hmm. banks will tell you they don't issue pre-approvals. Right. But if they look at the lender, if they I'm sorry, the borrower, if they look at the borrower and say, yeah, this is a good person, then they can wait on the financials for the practice. But it's still going to be based on that practice. Will it cash flow? But at least if they have a good borrower, then they know they're, they're halfway finished. So when you say a good borrower, are we talking about credit score-wise? or? Well, credit score-wise, uh, asset-wise, you know, what do they have? Are, are, are they going to be able to, to qualify for I the see. loan? I see. And I then see. Uh, does this practice fit in with mm. what they're looking for? I see. Okay. When you're evaluating that practice, when the buyer is evaluating that practice, you know, they're being told there's a certain number of patients, there's a certain number of new patients, the charts, how do they evaluate whether those charts are real and whether the numbers they've been given are valid and accurate? Well, there's a, a number of ways to do that. And um, I, I constantly kind of laugh at the, the most accepted method of doing that. And that is... The consultants will tell you, you go in and you actually do a chart audit, but to do a chart audit, you take about an inch of the charts <laughs> and the H's and the M's and I think maybe the P's, and you look at those and then you interpolate right. throughout all the charts that are there. Well, that's putting a lot of trust in what you're not seeing. Right. So I think it ought to be more comprehensive than that, uh, but it's totally up to the buyer to go do that. Now, in the seller's defense... Um, I haven't really seen any major problems come from uh, misrepresentation of, of the number of active patients. That's not one of the major problems that I've seen happen in practice transitions. Because it's supported in part by the financial statements and the tax returns. I mean, it, they can say they have X number of patients, but if the numbers aren't there to back up that income amount... You, you can kind of tell if there might be a discrepancy. Yeah, you Not can. Not necessarily, but there are clues. Uh, and there's other things, too. I'll give you a little maybe maybe accounting humor. I don't know. Not humor. <laughs> um, I'm looking at a practice right now for a client, and it showed uh, 18,000 active patients. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, no, this is not humanly possible. Well, you know, I asked a couple of questions and found out that the seller had changed software in the middle of the year last year. So every patient is now in the new software shows as an active patient because it's been within the last 18 months. Uh, <laughs> that's misleading. That is misleading. <laughs> but the, the cash flow is there. Uh, it's a very profitable practice, as a matter of fact. And that's what you have to look at. You have to look at the profitability, not necessarily just the active patients. Right. There are a number of factors. There's a lot of factors. Huh. You have to look at procedures, make sure that the seller uh, can provide all the procedures that, I'm sorry, make sure the buyer can provide all the procedures that the seller was offering. Uh, and quite often what we see is the older seller doctors uh, aren't offering some of the procedures the new younger doctors are trained to do. So that's an opportunity. Right. Um, and a lot of times you see an opportunity with the hygiene department if they're not producing what they should be producing. Uh, again, when I looked at recently, the hygiene department was producing something like 11 to 14 percent. Well, you know, that number is supposed to be around a third right. of total office collection. So it's a big opportunity there for the buyer. Wow. I actually feel bad for the people that have to evaluate practices that were uh, 
in operation during the COVID year last year? It's more challenging. Because, um, you know, I've, I've seen numbers that brokers actually have annualized uh, and their calculation is totally off because they attempted to eliminate the months where mm-hmm. the COVID closure occurred. Right, right, right. But they didn't subtract the collections from those months. Uh, so when they annualize the number by dividing by eight instead of 10 months, for yeah. instance, and then multiply by 12, well, they've overstated it. Um, so it's more challenging to, oh, okay. to adjust for those months. I see. So don't just take it for the word of the seller whenever you're looking into purchasing a practice. Consult with someone who will relook at those numbers and then affirm that, okay, that is a fair price that is being asked, and then move forward from there. Absolutely. Because if you depend on the numbers and later on you determine that the numbers were uh, misrepresenta- misrepresented, I think you've signed a waiver. Most of these uh, brokers uh, will give you a waiver to sign and, and you can't sue them. Mm. So they're not, they're not taking responsibility for their errors. I see. So get somebody that understands numbers, uh, a CPA, mm-hmm. um, to look over the numbers and dig into them and, and not only tell you whether they're accurate or not, but if they're not accurate, explain why. I see. Oh, that makes perfect sense. And ideally you would get one, someone from the Academy of Dental CPAs who actually is familiar with buying those practices and how much they should be going for and whether they can cash flow. I think that's a great idea. And I know um, Dental Town, Howard uh, Ferran, uh, certainly recommends that uh, dentists, every dentist should be using a CPA that, that works with at least 50 dentists. Uh, because that way, at least they have some degree of experience in working with, uh, with, with what you're looking at if you're a dentist. Right, 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 right. No, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, this is this is an analogy that I always use with my clients is that if you're driving a nice German car, you're not going to take it to just some average Joe mechanic. You will be looking for that specialized mechanic who knows how to work on your car. So it's it's just like that. It is just like that. Yeah, I agree. So as far as the the tangible assets in the practice, the intro or cameras and the digital equipment and the chairs, how much of a role do those play in the valuation? You know, I hesitate to say zero, but that's pretty much the answer. Okay. Uh, I mean, it helps if you have nice equipment, uh, of course, but once you do the valuation of the practice, then you do the allocation of the purchase price. And during the allocation is when you determine how much of that should be applicable to the tangible personal property or the dental equipment, software, the furniture. Uh, But that has no effect on the total valuation of the practice. That number is what it is, and you just allocate it. But it's not an irrelevant number. You're not saying that the assets are worthless. No. They do play a role in the valuation. Yes. Yes. If you had uh, some equipment uh, that was less than three years old, it's certainly going to lend something to the valuation if you have equipment that's over 20 years old it's not (laughs) right well and then the buyer has to consider what equipment he has to replace yes or whether she's going to have to take the office digital and i think we're seeing less of that than we were 10 years ago um but the one i was just talking about that changed software six months ago just went digital wow okay so there are still some out there (laughs) there are still some out there yes and that gets expensive when you're talking about an expensive practice. And then if you have to turn around and buy all new equipment for it, that is painful. And if we didn't have the pandemic last year, um, some practices probably wouldn't have converted. They took that downtime, uh, took advantage of it and converted. Uh, I Which saw was that. a smart thing to do. Yeah, it was. It was good it use was. of time. It was way overdue. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Ash, what else have your listeners been uh, asking about? Well, you know, I have quite a few startup clients and they they have a lot of questions regarding startup practices, but this is more about what to do after the practice is open. No, it it could be either way. Let me, I I don't know. I think we're kind of at the end of this. So let me just suggest one thing. If people want to find out more, they can listen to this um, or they can read this blog that I've found that says, what went wrong Wednesdays? That's the name of the blog, and that has suggestions about uh, things to do in a transition and how to avoid common problems. I think it's uh, interesting and, and informative. 
What Went Wrong Wednesdays. Interesting what title. What Went Wrong Wednesdays. Okay. WWW. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to say fast. Uh, that's one way to remember it. Yep. That's all I've got for this topic. All right. Great. Thank you so much for being on this episode and giving our listeners all these amazing tips. Absolutely. Anytime. Uh, so please be sure to tune in and listen to us again. We try to upload our episodes every two weeks and it's always a pleasure to have you guys. So if you guys ever need to reach out to us with questions or, you know, just to talk to us, uh, you can reach us at info at e and associates.com and, and is spelled with an A and D. Thank you. Great Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond Bite Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.